<laughs> too much to say. And uh, we're in trouble. Who's going to speak it as a family member? Unfortunately, I don't know who the speaker. Unfortunately, I don't know who the speaker is. It's not on the. Uh, it's not on the. Uh, on the link. I have no more information either.
jumping straight to the, uh, the second uh, the second uh, program on, our, on the schedule. Apologies for this, we're currently uh, looking for the missing speaker. Uh, hopefully he or she will be uh, at uh, the bench for the moment and uh, we'll be straight on to the second session. So hello, welcome to the uh, welcome to this session. Um, I am Christopher Cooper from Wikipedia myself. I do, I am somewhat familiar with OpenStreetMap, but I don't use it much. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, our video expert Michael for, for recording this session. Um, and of course I'll expect Mark for hosting us. If you want to tweet anything, use Wikimania 2014 and all the standard stuff. Um, so okay, we're going to begin today with um, for the first 30 minutes uh, with a session about OpenStreetMap. So yeah, if you're going to talk about Glamour or anything else, you're in the wrong room. Um, so yeah, it's Wikipedia, Wikimedia and OpenStreetMap, History, Current Status and Challenges. And I'll hand over to you, Jill. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, actually, I was hoping that Andy would be giving the first talk because he's supposed to give an introduction about OpenStreetMap. So that will tie into my presentation so that I would have to explain more what OpenStreetMap is. But unfortunately, he's not here, so I'll just give a very short introduction of OpenStreetMap. It's basically uh, a Wikipedia for maps. So instead of people uh, collaborating to build an encyclopedia, it's a bunch of people all over the world collaborating to build a database of geodata. So uh, just keep that in mind. It's just basically a database of geographical data. So basically, I will try to explain uh, how OpenStreetMap and Wikimedia projects can work together. So I'll be giving a short um, history of what has been done before, what are the current things that we're doing right now, and some of the challenges that we are facing with regards to further collaboration between Wikimedia and OpenStreetMap. So I'll first talk about what, uh, how OpenStreetMap is using stuff from the Wikimedia world uh, for its projects. So first of all, well, when we teach uh, people about this we tell them it's like a media for maps. That's the very easiest way we uh, can think of how to explain what this street map is. So that's just basically it. This street map is uh, like a like media for maps, or more specifically for geodata. And um, most people think of maps as this image or the thing that you draw on something. But actually, we collect geodata, so coordinates, lines, and shapes like that. And the attributes that go along with it, such as, for example, what type of object it is, if it's a map or a restaurant, the name, the address, and stuff like that. Uh, second, of all, second thing is we use MitoWiki as our uh, documentation. So the OpenStreetMap Wiki, which contains all of the documentation for our project, uses MitoWiki. And when we talk about stuff that needs to be mapped on OpenStreetMap, we frequently point readers to Wikipedia for definitions. For example, if you want to map addicts or entrance to an underground mine, we link to the Wikipedia article so they can learn more what addict is. And we also um, show pictures from Wikipedia Commons. We don't have to take any pictures, we just grab them from Wikipedia Commons. And for example, if you do a search for the city of Uganda on the website of OpenStreetMap, you can get the, you can get the data. And one of the things we do is we can tag objects in OpenStreetMap with the weekly article. So for example, there's a tag there saying that this object has a Wikipedia article. And we point them to the Wikipedia article. So for example, you can just click on that link and you will take it to the article on the city of London. Um, note the orange, uh, orange outline there. That will be important later on when I talk about some of the some of the cool things that Wikipedia has been doing with regards to OpenStreetMap data. And we also uh, use Wikidata. So as an alternative to tagging objects with links to Wikipedia, you can also tag objects with links to the Wikidata entry. Um, this was actually just recently introduced, and there's a bit, some, a bit of pushback in the community regarding tagging objects with Wikidata entries because they think it's not really user or user friendly to look for the I did data ID, but I think that's just a matter of uh, proper editor tools, which we currently don't have right now. And another last thing is, um, very recently, the OpenStreetMap Foundation has approved the local chapters agreement template. So as of now, we don't really have any official local chapters in the OpenStreetMap project. So what, what they did was they actually just copied 
the Wikimedia Foundation template for the contractors in the middle. And then just edit it with it and uh, uh, edit it and make it uh, for the own use. <coughs> so another thing that we've used uh, Wikipedia is we've used the uh, Wikipedia language into Wikileaks in order to increase the main language tags in OpenStreetMap. So in OpenStreetMap, you can tag the name of the object in many different languages. So we use uh, Wikipedia in order to complete those uh, name tags. So that's uh, basically some of the things that uh, OpenStreetMap has been using Wikimedia projects for in the day in OpenStreetMap. Now let's go over to the what, uh, how OpenStreetMap is being used in the Wikimedia projects. And I think this is more interesting to you guys. So first of all, static maps. We know that articles are more informative in the map of, the, of things that is being described in the Wikipedia article. And OpenStreetMap has been a pretty uh, constant source of data for creating these maps. So this is uh, one of the early uh, articles on Wikipedia, um, the town of Weybridge in the United Kingdom. This is the first instance that an OpenStreetMap map was used for Wikipedia. So that's the map on the right side. Here's a big picture. So basically, most people, what they do is they just go to the website of OpenStreetMap, take a screenshot of the place, and stick that on Wikipedia. So another example is the map of the post Concordia cruise ship disaster. So somebody <coughs> took a screenshot of the location, added some annotations, and then uploaded it to Wikipedia Homes. But this is just a uh, static image, a PNG image, so it's not a uh, vector image. But um, if you go to the, uh, to the website of OpenStreetMap, you can actually export SDGs images. For example, here's a map of Cambridge. You just zoom into Cambridge on OpenStreetMap, click the share button, and then you can select the, you can select the SDG format, and then you can get an SDG file of the map of what you're seeing right now. Though. OpenStreetMap website. But if you are more adventurous, you can actually get the actual data behind OpenStreetMap and create your own maps from scratch. For example, here's the key voyage map of the West End part of Washington, D.C. So what the contributor did was he bought the data from OpenStreetMap and created his own map using that data. Another example here is the map of Macau. The coastlines and the transportation roads were all taken from OpenStreetMap. And actually, these types of uh, these kinds of maps, there's already an existing IEG map in the foundation in order to more properly or more quickly create types of maps like these. This is called the Wikimaps Atlas. This is done by two Wikipedians in the world. And I think uh, well, I, I know we're supposed to hear the conference, but and, uh, I haven't seen them yet. So here they are. They, were, they attended the Zurich Hackathon recently in order to continue hacking at their project. And hopefully we can see the results of their project uh, soon. Next, another, possible, uh, another popular use of OpenStreetMap is for dynamic maps. So instead of just having a plain static map on your TV articles, you can get an interactive map, something like you see on Google Maps. So the first, well, the first dynamic map that you can see on Wikipedia is the Wikimedia Atlas created by Daniel. So basically, for example, if you go to the article in the city of London on Wikipedia, you can just click on the blue icon on the upper right corner, and that will show a pop-up uh, dynamic map. You can manipulate this map much like you would do on, you would do on Google Maps. And as you can see, you can see the blue outline of the, of the subject in question. So that data was taken home from OpenStreetMap. It's not stored. Uh, that wasn't taken, that wasn't provided by Wikipedia. That was taken from OpenStreetMap. And I will talk about that a little bit later. And one cool thing about Wikimedia is it has, is it has a size comparison feature. So for example, you can compare the sizes of different territories. For example, here's the uh, shape of text stored on the DR Congo. And there's also, if you have a hardware accelerated uh, web uh, capable PC, you can look at 3D buildings on Wikimedia Atlas. So the 3D information was also taken from OpenStreetMap. So that's also like Google 
maps on you. They're not a 3D feature of Google Maps. So another uh, dynamic map uses OSM for some magic like in this here setting. So OSM magic is enabled on the German Wikipedia. So here's the German article, uh, Wikipedia article that's still down there. There's a, uh, there's supposed to be an open street map icon on the right side. When you click on that, you can get a thing similar to the map as showing uh, much like a, a similar object. But here you can also find links to other Wikipedia, uh, nearby Wikipedia articles that are already geo-coded. And there's that same red outline. So in Wiki Voyage, they are also, they're also using dynamic maps based on the map. So for example, here's uh, for Oswego. There's a dynamic map on the right side. And the uh, little icons you see over there are coordinated. They correspond to the points of interest on the article itself. Then you can also uh, go to a full page dynamic map on key voyage. You get, there's a button that there's a link on the upper right corner. If you click on that, you will be directed to a full page map view. And same thing, you have uh, little uh, icons or markers on the map showing the different places that are already described on the wiki voyage article. So some of the more technical aspects of uh, OpenStreetMap as we've seen in the projects is that back in the world, we have a tile server. And the recent uh, information of the tile server uh, was created by developer Kai Tim and Alexander's Foundation. So basically, in OpenStreetMap, we have what we call the planet. And that's basically the database of everything, uh, all of the data in OpenStreetMap. And what people can do is they can get, they can copy the whole database or extracts of it, but here in Kini, you copy the book, you copy everything, we call it replication. And from there, you can create tiles. So from the database, you can produce the tiles, and these are what powers the background behind the dynamic maps. So here, um, awesome servers and the servers. So um, one possible use for the tile server is to power the map feature behind the Wikipedia mobile app. This is the old version, not the new version. The old version had a map. And you can use the tile server for providing the background, the, the base map for the map feature. Um, unfortunately, um, it's not yet uh, in the pipeline for the current version of the Mo Wikimedia mobile uh, app because we need to have a robust tile server because it's expected that Many users will be using this and need to have a, a stable infrastructure so that the server won't crash when a lot of people use the map feature. Another possible uh, backend component that we would like to develop is the vector tiles. So instead of having static tile images, it would be nice if you can get vector tiles. So the data is provided as vectors. So you can do time side rendering of the map. So I think that's what. Google Maps doing for the recent uh, mobile app for Google, I think. So that's in the pipeline. And another back in Google then is the We Awesome or Wikipedia where in Awesome developed by Tim and um, user master from the OpenStreet Cap community. So what's what it is is basically the same infrastructure, but instead of having tiles, you have the We Awesome database. So basically it's just a database of Geo JSON files for each and every object in OpenStreetMap that has been tagged with a Wikipedia article or a Wikidata article. So that's what powers the outlines that you see on the maps on Wikipedia. So the same outline that you see on the OpenStreetMap website you can get also from the Wikipedia article. So that's just some of the things that we're doing uh, on the Wikipedia Foundation side. And some of the chapters, the uh, media chapters, are also doing their part in collaborating with OpenStreetMap community. First of these is Wikimedia the Indonesia and the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. So if you're interested, there will be a Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team workshop later after the break. So what they did was uh, Wikimedia Indonesia and the Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team recently in April had a joint office. So they're sharing their office together in a building in Jakarta. 
And these are some of the members from both uh, Wikimedia Indonesia and Hot IT. And in June, they were, uh, in June, I think, they got a joint grant approved in order to develop or write Wikipedia articles and to map, uh, to map Kalimantan, that's in Mordeo, for both Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia Bahasa Indonesia and uh, OpenStreetMap. Next, Wikimedia Italia is um, going to be the Italian OSM local chapter. So as I, uh, as I mentioned before, the local chapter agreement template was recently approved by the OpenStreetMap Foundation. And uh, Wikimedia Italia is trying to uh, build the pipeline as the Italian OSM local chapter. As a, as a, in a uh, what we did was last year, for the first time, Wikimedia Italia organized the OSM 19 conference, which is the annual OpenStreetMap Italy conference. So they did that last October, you know, very well. Then there's also Wikimedia Finland. They have this Wikimedia Wikimaps project, which is basically a historical maps project. And this is led by Susanna from Wikimedia Finland. And here's an example mock up of a possible user interface for um, contributing to the project. So what they did was they planned to um, improve on the existing editor interface on OpenStreetMap and integrate that so that you can edit historical maps on the Wikimaps project. Uh, there's also Wikimedia Deutschland. What they did was they, in, 20, in 2012, they sponsored the development of the multilingual OSM map. So this was developed by Jochen from the German OpenStreetMap community. And the idea is that you can have background maps without labels. Create separate labels for different languages, just Japanese and French. And then you can overlay them on top of each other to produce your multilingual maps. So there's a plan to uh, incorporate this technology into the Wikimedia Foundation servers, hopefully the WMF tool labs. So that, those are some of the things that are being uh, currently between OpenStreetMap and the Wikimedia community. And now I'll be talking about legal issues. So uh, one question that's been asked often is, can OpenStreetMap and Wikimedia projects share data, such as geographical coordinates? The answer probably not, but I'm not a lawyer, so. So why is that? So here's the different licenses used by different projects. As you may know, Wikimedia uses CC by SA and GFDL for all the articles. Wikimedia uses CC by SA, Wikimedia CC0, and sorry for the cutoff, but OpenStreetMap uses what we call the Open Database license. Previously, before 2012, it was CC by SA. And that's actually the single biggest crisis that the OpenStreetMap community ever faced, the switch from CC by SA to OpenStreetMap. The idea was that we uh, quickly decided that CC by SA is not appropriate for the database project. It's more appropriate for copyright related projects and not really for a database, uh, supposedly a database of facts. So supposedly uh, the CC by uh, CC for suite of licenses should be able to fix that. But before then, there was no CC for So the community decided to go to OBDA for a database license. So first question. Sorry, can I can't quite see it. Um, something outside the screen. Mm -hmm. um, I'll just upload the presentation. So I apologize for that. Uh, for the cutoff, but it's mostly OD here. Yeah. Okay. So, to continue. Sorry. Sorry, okay. Uh, to continue, well, one question is can we take geographical data from OpenStreetMap and stick them into Wikipedia? For example, if a Wikipedia article doesn't have yet, or the can we get that? Can we get that on OpenStreetMap? Uh, the question is no, because that. Uh, we have these conflicting legal concepts. Uh, first, that's the not copyrightable, that's the blockchain in the US legal system, versus the sui generis database right, which is um, in the European Union. The thing is, um, you can probably take one or two or a few data points from OpenStreetMap and put that on uh, Wikipedia. 
but if there's a systematic uh, importation of data from OpenStreetMap, which is a database into Wikipedia, you have to follow the terms of the Open Database License. And, it, and that's, not, that's not really compatible with the current license, which is CC by ASK3 from Wikipedia. So what are the requirements of the ODBL that are difficult? The uh, problem is uh, you need to yeah, you need to provide a data. If you yeah, if you get a database, uh, if you derive another database from or maybe a licensed database, you need to provide that derived database under the same terms as the ODB does. And you need to provide attribution. And if you cannot provide the database itself, you need to provide the means that you can be created the right database. So uh, I can explain all of these things, but you don't have time. So if you have more questions, I can probably talk to you later. So next. Uh, so there's a, um, the opinion is basically uh, that you cannot really copy, mass copy, geographic coordinates from office with that would be here. What about the other way around? Uh, Wikidata is supposed to be CC by CC0, so there's no restriction at all. And you can supposedly import the coordinates from CC, uh, from Wikidata to OpenStreetMap. The problem is that the geographic coordinates from in Wikidata were taken from Wikipedia. And as some of you may know, many of the coordinates on Wikipedia were taken by using Google Maps. And OpenStreetMap community is very, very allergic to people using Google Maps. Why? The Google Maps Terms of Service has what we call restrictions on, on use. For example, unless you have received prior written authorization from Google, you cannot copy, translate, modify, or make the data works at the content or any part thereof. We disagree with uh, sub-license, etc., etc. And use the products in a manner that gives you or any other person access to mass downloads or all feeds of any content, including but not limited to numerical, latitude, or longitude coordinates. And you cannot use Google Maps to create a database of places or other local listing of information. So, because of that, uh, the OpenStreetMap community has this very strict position. It is an established principle in OpenStreetMap that we don't import geodata community. So, that's basically the uh, lay of the land with regards to the legal issues between further collaborations between Wikipedia projects and OpenStreetMap. But for the most part, uh, we're getting a long time. You can produce maps by uh, you can produce maps from OpenStreetMap data and stick them into Wikipedia. That's not a problem. So yeah. Yes, what, what is the principal source of the data that's in OpenStreetMaps today? The principal source is mainly uh, personal knowledge, people going around and surveying around. And also, so is, is that come from a sort of crowdsourcing type of? Yes. Go around with their iPhones and yes, yes. So as I said, obviously, my is that it can from us. It's crowdsourced, crowdsourced, it's collaborative. And we're all, we can also derive data from sources that have explicitly given permission to the street map for deriving data. Most notable example and probably surprising for many is Microsoft. So they have this Bing Maps service, which has um, satellite imagery, much like what you can see on Google Maps. And they gave uh, land, the Atlantic permission to OpenStreetMap to trace all over the satellite imagery in, from Bing Maps and put that into OpenStreetMap without any need for attributing Microsoft for Bing. Okay. Uh, most notably, Google has not given that kind of permission, so we don't, we really don't uh, encourage people to use Google Maps. Okay. So, so guys, today is the 10th anniversary of the street map. Yeah. Okay. Don't know when OpenStreetMap 
have started what we think of as known as the birthday because that was when the domain name was registered. <laughs> okay, so it's a good thing. Uh, we're here in London where we can sell things for things. And um, later on, it's Andy here. Andy will give more, uh, will give a talk more about the uh, introduction to OpenStreetMap. And later on, after the morning break, we have a uh, inventory of OpenStreetMap workshop where we can teach you how to contribute to OpenStreetMap. Okay. So if you have any questions. What yeah. time is that session? Well, at that time, uh, 11 30. Yes. If we've got data, I think in particular of historical maps, which we're starting to georeference now, if as part of that we record where we've got the geolocated data from, i.e., which layer from the existing map we've matched by historical map, and so we can show that it's not from Google Maps, would OpenStreetMap be okay with that? Yes, as long as you can. Yeah. But if you can prove that the map is uh, in the public domain, and if it's your if it's your reference without if it's your reference without looking at other copyrighted maps. So for example, if you get your reference to a public domain map using Google Maps, you need a contract. But if it's your reference against the open street map or your reference against a big map would be alright. Um maybe not big maybe uh, just a good feedback. That should work.
Yes. Uh, I have a list of uh, objects with address without the coordinate. Uh, does the Atlas or the OpenStreetMap can make a, a coordinate from an address? So your, uh, your question is basically you have a list of addresses and you want to get coordinates from those addresses. Usually I go to Google Map and yeah. find the coordinates yes. there. Yeah, that's why we call geocoding, uh, turning addresses to coordinates. And there's actually, uh, there's actually a lot of tools already on OpenStreetMap. Uh, the most notable example is Nominatum. That's a software for geocoding. It can turn a search thing such as an address and provide it with coordinates. So that is possible. Okay, there are no more questions. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, we've run out of time. Geographical information. 
which you can render as a map, and that's how most people see it. And there is a map render that looks a little bit like this. This is an out-of-date screenshot that changed the chrome since then, uh, which most people think is OpenStreetMap, but that's just a way of presenting how it looks. And it is not, I repeat, it is not intended to be a replacement for Google Maps or Bing Maps or other maps by directing people to this page. It will work like that, but that's not really the intention. This is just intended to show people what's in the database. This, by the way, is the area of North Birmingham near to where I live. There's a slightly more close-up view. So, unlike Google Maps, there's a lot more detail. Uh, and unlike Google Maps, this is usually right. <laughs> uh, we've all seen Google Maps where the building we're trying to get to is shown on the wrong side of the road or three blocks north, south, east or west of where it should be. We're slightly more thorough than that. <coughs> and one of the interesting things about OpenStreetMap is that anybody can render the data. The clues in the title, it is open. So you can download the entire data set or a data set around a geographical region such as where you live or work or based on a theme like you can download all the railway stations and ignore all the airports or whatever you want to do. And then you can render it with your own styles. So you can make it look like that or like that which is a slightly different render. Uh, and um, there are several different tools that would allow you to do this. I'll show you some examples. I'm not going to tell you how to do that because it's not what I do. I put stuff into OpenStreetMap and I leave it to other people to get stuff out. So that's the same area again. Would anybody like to tell me what that's showing? Transport. Close. Traffic. More specifically, go. These are the roads that are gritted or salted oh. in winter. Uh, and this was a collaborative effort that I had the map was in the West Midlands region of England around the city of Birmingham worked on a couple of winters ago. We, did, uh, we asked the local authorities to give us their gritting data. In a couple of cases, we had to do freedom of information requests. And then we added tags to the map data to say this road is gritted. And the councils who were very reluctant to give us that information, why do you want to know this? What are you going to do with it? What if it's wrong? What if you map it and somebody dies? Um, but they had to give us data. And then they saw this, and then they started putting this map on their web page. <laughs> Uh, and now we have the problem every year of getting them to tell us what's changed. They will give us the data again, and we have to go through it. And when I say data, they will give us PDFs of scanned types documents or whatever. Uh, we have to go through and try and spot the differences. What we would really like us to do is to say, we've stopped gritting such and such a street, and we're gritting so and so street instead. And that would make our lives much easier. Better still, what we would like them to do is to go and edit the damn map themselves, because like Wikipedia, this is something that anybody can go and edit. So we're quite happy to train them to do that. But that's the gridding map, and, and there is the, the render of it. As I say, this is not on OpenStreetMap.org. This is a separate render. Uh, um, we'll get the address onto the Ether pad at the end of this presentation if nobody does it while I'm speaking. <coughs> but this is a separate render by Map and Mercy, the, the West Midlands Regional Mapping Team. Um, showing all the gritty maps, and we show different priorities. So uh, the red, apologies for your colour blind, but the red is the high priority that gets gritted first, the blue and then the light blue get gritted later on. Now, in theory, somebody who writes a sat nav or a similar type of application for cars could query this database, get this data, and when you say take me from this place to this place, Normally it gives you the option of the fastest route or the quietest route or the most scenic route. But it could say, well, the sensor in your car says it's minus two degrees, so I'll give you the route with the most gritted roads and I'll keep you off the ungritted roads. So that's one application that this data potentially has if somebody will get around to writing the actual software to do it. Uh, same area again, would anybody like to guess what this map is showing? Well done, yes. Uh, it's showing real alpubs and breweries, which is obviously closely related, again, in North Birmingham. Um, obviously a highly vital use of the data. Uh, I'm sure you But the point of this is, this is, again, a separate render. Somebody has pulled in the data from OpenStreetMap and, and overlaid their own database, which is what I think the gentleman over here was asking about earlier. That's an example of how you can do that. And again, I'm not going to tell you how to do that, because frankly, I would have struggled to do it. I'd have to go and read the manual. 
Um, but it's all on the OpenStreetMap wiki if you want to do that. I'm the guy who puts the data in there to help that happen. And there's one of the points, that the, my, one of my local little microbreweries uh, in North Birmingham. So once you put that data in and you've got your overlay, it is possible to have a little bit of JavaScript that pop up, uh, sometimes pictures, not in this case, and text, and hyperlinks to other things. So it becomes far more, uh, more of a utility than a simple map. And the easiest way to do that, by the way, uh, joking aside, is to find somebody who's already done it and hack their code. And there's plenty of examples of that around as well. There's another render of North Birmingham. Anybody have any idea what that is? That's well done. Yeah, you're on the ball, you lot. I usually have to struggle with an audience trying to guess what these are. That's the railway network around North Birmingham. But look how different it is. The colours are completely different. There's no roads. Most of the place names aren't shown, only the uh, significant stations. So you can do what you want with this data. Similar thing again, Birmingham, you should know this one. Canals. The, the old adage, Birmingham had more miles of canals than Venice. Uh, well, a completely different type of canal, but it is strictly true. Uh, and I think, no, my, I'll show you a little slide about that later. How about this one for Birmingham? John Speed. <laughs> no, it's Birmingham, not London. Bus stations. No. I'll give you a clue. There are two big gaps. The one top right is a park, sort of park, the large urban park in Europe, and the one sort of below left of centre, um, sorry, below right of centre, is the Bourneville area that the Cadbury's built as a model village. Pubs, pubs, no, pubs, pubs. Bourneville, being a Quaker area, has no pubs. <laughs> this is something a friend of mine called John Bounds did, uh, actually for an art installation. So all he did was render all the pubs in Birmingham. Nothing else, just the dots for where they are and their names, no boundaries or anything. But you can see the big concentrations are in the city centre, the hip, um, hipster area, the sort of Notting Hill of Birmingham, if you like, uh, and the student areas for some reason. Uh, so you can also probably tell where they hold most of our open street, meet, open street map meetup in Birmingham. And there's the fourth thing, it's called the Inebrian Survey, which you did in 2011. And you used to be able to buy that as a poster from the art gallery where it was uh, exhibited. And that again illustrates the point, this is open data, you can reuse it even commercially. You can print it out and sell it if you want to, uh, 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 no extra charge, it's under a completely open license. This is a separate render again, this is done for a mobile device, so it obviously has a lot less clutter than a, a, what you would say on a desktop device. And this is for a lower resolution mobile device with a different set of software. And that's for a GPS, so that's, that's pretty minimalistic. That doesn't look like the original map scenes that I've shown you, but it's using similar data from, from the OpenStreetMap database. And this is, again, canals. This, is, this ties into the other image I showed you. Um, and what the person who did this application rendered is all the things near the canal that somebody on a canal holiday is likely to want. Surprise, surprise, the pubs are on there again. But they also show you where you can pump out your toilets from your canal boat uh, and the nearest shops to the canal side and the overbridges and the road network that will get you from the canal to the pub or the shop. But they don't show you anything else because when you're on a canal boat you can't leave the canal. You're tied to walking distance or cycle distance uh, of the canal. So that's all you need on your GPS if you're on a canal holiday. So again, very, very tailored. Uh, data presentation to a specific use case. So I've mentioned um, <coughs> uh, mobile devices a couple of times and there are a lot of different software applications specifically tailored to mobiles including editors and the best editor for mobile I've found is for Suchi. Is that you? No, no, no. I like it too. Oh, good. Um, and that's named after an Italian cartographer because it was written by Italians reasonable. Um, now, I would advise you not to use this to try and trace the outlines of buildings, because doing that with your finger on a small mobile is pretty difficult to do accurately. But this is excellent for adding tags to existing things. So, on the top deck of the bus, on your way to work in the morning, uh, you can look out and say, oh, that, that, that uh, cheese shop has now become a wine shop, I'll go and change the tags in OpenStreetMap. The speech is a very useful uh, little application for doing that. As I say, one of several. 
Uh, and it looks like that when you use it. So again, you can imagine trying to draw those buildings with your finger would be impossible, but it is possible to add the tags. I said it's one of several applications. There's a few more. These are all for Android. There's a few of them. There's a few more. There's a few more. There's a few more. There are more than 10 pages of Android apps on the Android store. Uh, and I guess with iOS there'll be probably fewer, but still a large number. Yeah. And they do different things, just like the maps I've shown you do different things. So there is an app called Wheel Map, which, uh, if you didn't know, uh, wouldn't appear to be an open street map editor at all. It's an application for people with disability or people who want to support people with disabilities. And it detects where you are and says, oh, I see you're in this building, this shop, this library, this uh, exhibition hall or whatever. Please, can you answer these questions? Is it wheelchair accessible? Does it have a, a, an accessible toilet? And if so, do you need a special key for the toilet? And people go, yes or no, click, click, click. And that then gets entered into OpenStreetMaps as tags for the accessibility of that building. Even without the people who are doing it knowing that they're necessarily open, anything over street map. If they read the help file, they'll know that who does that. So, there's no reason why somebody, and I'm looking at you like, couldn't write an application that does that for other things. I see you're in a, re a restaurant, what type of food does it serve? I see you're at a bus stop, does it, is it a shelter or a pole with a flag on the top? You can do all sorts of things to tag open street map. So I've shown you how um, the different maps can be rendered and I've told you that there are tools to help you do it and I don't know much about them but I'm now going to just give you some illustrations of what some of them are uh, and you can then go away and practice with them and learn them and with all of these there are code samples that you could just mess around with. So one of them is map Erative, which you can use to make a map that looks like that. Zooming in it looks a bit like that. Again, completely different render. Or you can do a heat map with it that looks like that to represent your data. But, um, I think this one might be cycling accidents or vehicle accidents over a certain set of streets. You can even add topographical layers to, to, to shade in uh, altitudes of mountainous regions like that. And the code looks something like that, which uh, may or may not scare you depending on your skill set. But if you're looking at that thinking, oh yes, I know what that means, you're, you're well on your way to rendering those sorts of maps. Once you've done the render, you write a style, sorry, once you've coded the render to say what sort of data you want in it, you then write a style sheet, very similar to a web style sheet, if you've done web style sheets, cascading style sheets, you'll recognise what's here. You do something very similar to change the render of the map in map parity. And indeed, the original OpenStreetMap also uses style sheets in this sort of fashion. So you say, you know, I want the rivers to be yellow and the side tracks to be purple and the, uh, you know, the mountains to be orange or whatever your particular tastes uh, and purposes require to use. It's as simple as that. Uh, and you can also include what you want to show uh, in a similar way. Uh, I think this slide, which I was adding when I should have been here first thing this morning, uh, might be out of sequence, so I apologise for that. Uh, and did you talk about humanitarian open street map? A little bit. Okay, so I won't uh, dwell on that one now. I was going to talk about this a little bit later. So the next thing is Leaflet, which is another uh, renderer, as it says there. It's a JavaScript library for rendering maps within your web pages. Uh, it enables you to put slippy maps in, I think. Uh, so, you know, that's the map that you can scroll around and zoom in out within your own web page. And that looks like that. That's JavaScript code. I don't code JavaScript, but I've done this simply by copying and pasting this and changing the numbers and the, the labels until I got what I wanted to appear on the page. It's that trivial. Um, you can do more things with it, it obviously is far more advanced, but to get started it's very simple. And there is Mapbox, which is another free tool that allows you to render maps uh, and do things like this, which was done in Mapbox, I believe. Um, this is a, another overlay of data, very much like the uh, question that was asked earlier. Uh, these are all the things in uh, the Birmingham area which are listed buildings, uh, what we call monuments for Wikilow's monuments, um, uh, or commemorative plaques where you have a plaque on the wall that says, you know, um, Milton was born here, Winston Churchill gave a speech here, whatever it might be. Uh, those are all rendered on this map and, oh, I'll get 
get a slide missing over here. But if you click on one of the points, you get a little pop up that tells you more information, and in this case, has a photograph. And the photographs for this are drawn in from Wikimedia Commons. But it could be anywhere, you can just give it the URL of an image until it's displayed. So you can have quite a lot of fun playing around with these various tools. Um, a lot of people are providing tools that make use of OpenStreetMap data one way or the other. Quite a lot of them obviously are just doing different map renders uh, or are doing overlays like we've seen. But there are also tools that are, are more <coughs> there to help the map editors. And one of these is Map Compare, which is produced by a German app called Geofabric, uh, which looks like this. And it enables you to put two maps side by side. Uh, and it gives you a lot of maps to choose from. In fact, I think it will also do four side by side, but that starts to get rather clustered on screen. So this is showing uh, the map nick render of OpenStreetMap, in other words, a default map, uh, shown against, excuse me, shown against Google Maps. Uh, oh look, which one has all the detail? Uh, um, but you can see there, um, quite easy to compare them and as you scroll around or zoom in this both of the maps move in parallel the zoom goes in and out in parallel so you can very easily check stuff you should never use this to copy from google maps to OpenStreetMap because of the licensing uh, that would be a breach of copyright and we don't want that and you can get into a lot of trouble if you do uh, but it is useful if you just need to do a sanity check on what you've mapped or uh, if you just want to show people what the difference is, uh, then you can have a look at this uh, as a useful tool. So let's have a look at how OpenStreetMap actually works. So how many of you have done some mapping in OpenStreetMap? Well, I guess that's a little bit under half of you. Okay, you can go to sleep for the next 10 minutes. Um, oh, you're already asleep, I'm sorry. <laughs> First of all, a little word about editing tools. I've shown you with Spoochie, which is a mobile editor. There are a number of desktop-based editors, uh, and it doesn't matter which one you use, it's a matter of personal choice, or some would say it's a matter of religious choice. Um, it usually depends which you learn first. Now, I use an editor called Josm, the Java OpenStreetMap editor. It's a very powerful tool. It's a standalone application that you can download. It's, it's open license, open source software. There's a repository where you can just changes or submit changes. You can also edit on the web-based interface for OpenStreetMap by just clicking the edit button and there are other tools as well. So I'm going to show you Josm today because that's what I use. It looks very different to the other editors but the principles are the same. The, the, the data is stored in the same way. So first of all, nice red British pillar box. What's special about that pillar box? Anybody know? Yes? That's for where we drop our names. Okay. That is for where we drop our names. Yes, that's what it's for. Yeah. But this, this is a very, not unique, but a very rare one. Let's have another look. Yeah. Age. Anybody know that? Edward the Eighth. Thank you, Edward oh. the Eighth. Edward the Eighth is the king who abdicated over Mrs. Simpson before his coronation. And there are only, I think, 20 or 21 Edward the Eighth pillar boxes in the world. Uh, of which we have one right as that was right in the middle of Birmingham. So you sometimes see uh, geeky tourists having their photograph taken next to it. Uh, and I always bore visitors to Birmingham by insisting I take them to it and show them it. So but let's have a look at how that looks on OpenStreetMap. It's that little red dot that looks like an envelope in the middle of this render. This is the Josm tool. So uh, I'll try and shout because I'm moving away from the microphone. Three components. A view of the data, it's just another render of the map data. The tags, which we're going to talk about in a little while, and some other tools that we're not going to talk about for now. <coughs> First of all, on the left, you, you select the area you want to download and download the data, and you can filter that. So you can say, show me all the buildings, don't show me the roads, or vice versa. Uh, and in the top right hand corner you have these tags and they work in, tag, in pairs of strings so you have the amenity is a post box you have the uh, operator in this country is royal mail the royal cipher the, the crest on the front is that one for edward the eighth and the actual lettering is e then the roman numeral eight and then r which stands for the latin word rex meaning king 
and you have the source, you say where you've got that data. In this case, uh, I did a visual survey, I went and looked at it, and then I estimated the position, because I didn't have a GPS with me, but it was outside a certain building, so I knew within a few inches where, where it was and should be on the map, and that, that's accurate enough for this purpose. And you have a note parameter, so you can actually put a note in there for other editors. That's not seen on any of the map renders, but it's there for, to help somebody else with editing to go, oh, oh, I see why Andy's bothered to put this one on, or, or whatever. If you're mapping for the first time, and I hope you will all go away and have a go at mapping over the next few days, and you're not sure what the tags are, there's two ways to do this. One is to find a similar object. So find another post box and copy it, or copy the tags, uh, and adjust them as required. But the other one is to go to the OpenStreetMap Wiki, which is based on MediaWiki software, the same as Wikipedia and our other projects, and a lot of the tags are described there. Unfortunately, not all of them are described there. So again, if you fancy a volunteer task, you can go and edit the wiki and help to improve the documentation, and I would certainly encourage you to do that. Um, if you don't find a tag for your purpose, you can invent a new one. That's how they get started. Now, there is a formal process, similar to Wikipedia RFCs, for proposing a tag and voting, uh, and if you want to spend all your time doing that, that's fine. Or you can actually do something useful. <laughs> so if you just invent a tag, either somebody will come along and change it to a pre-existing tag, and you'll think, oh, I see that's been changed, I'll, I'll use the pre-existing tag in future, or lots of other people will go, oh, that's brilliant, why haven't we got that before? I'll start using that as well. And over time, you will see more people use it. And again, there are tools that will show you which tags are in use, and how often they're used, and where in the world they're used. And the, the mailing list where all these RFCs and so on go is useful if you just want to say, I've done this, does anybody have any comments? Or should we, you know, should we discuss um, all the Americans are tagging things like this and all the Europeans are tagging things like that? Can we agree to do it one way between us? And usually you can come to agreement. Hi. Are the values of control vocabulary or are they free text? So they're free text in nearly all cases. They can be control values for specific purposes, and I'll show you a couple of examples of that later on. Uh, but in that case, they're still strings. There's, no, there there's nothing that will stop you putting a bad value in, but there are some tools that will go and check them afterwards and remove them or correct them if they're wrong. Is this like Yes, yeah. 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 again, I'll, I'll show you that shortly. So this is how you do the tagging. Uh, and as I say, you can mint your own tags, as we call it, and invent them, or you can use the pre-existing ones um, if you wish to. And on the wiki, if it's well documented, as the royal cipher tag is, uh, you will find pictures and illustrations and uh, examples of use and all sorts. Uh, but as I say, some tags aren't well uh, documented, so you won't always find that, but it's worth looking. And you will see them usually described as key colon in the name. It's the key name space. I refer to them as tags. Some people call them keys, so uh, that's what you need to look for. And you can see here, we have translations of the documentation. Um, and unfortunately, in this case, they're, they're all red links. In other words, nobody has translated this into any other languages. Given that it's a very British thing, that's probably not such a big problem. But when you're tagging fast food restaurants or railway stations, then we do need the documentation to be translated. And that is yet another way in which you and your friends can contribute to OpenStreetMap. You can help to update and translate documentation. So let's have a look at another place in Birmingham with some tags on. This is a theatre called the Repertory Theatre, or the Rep, and it has two blue plaques. I mentioned those plaques earlier. They're the sort of things that you put on a building that said, somebody famous lived or worked here. And this is the set of tags for one of those blue plaques. Uh, again, according to a scheme that has evolved over time through people using different tags and then merging them and agreeing between themselves how to operate. It's a historic memorial. It has a name, uh, which is that it's a blue plaque. That's a little bit of a fudge because the plaque doesn't actually have a name, but you need some sort of label. Uh, we have a note saying that it's been resurveyed because the building was renovated and they moved the plaque. Uh, and uh, we have the source that was a survey, but we also have the Oakland Plaques plaque ID 1563. I'd like you to remember that number, 1563. There's no prizes, but I would like you to remember it. 
That's the reference number in a database of a website called OpenPlax. Uh, I think it's openplax.org, which is an open source project that records all the blue plaques or similar plaques in Britain and the world. It's a UK started project, but it's now international. Something else you can contribute to, you can upload your photos, you can record your local plaques, you can transcribe them. It's a very worthwhile thing. Uh, but we've decided to, rather than import all that data into OpenStreetMap, we just link out to their entries. Because there's no point putting all the transcriptions in the map, it would be too much to do. So there's the entry on the Open Plaques website. You've got a nice picture, or several pictures of the plaque. They use OpenStreetMap, which they render inside their website to show you where it is. So a little bit circular there. And their URL at the top of the page has 1563, which is the number I showed you earlier as the value. So in terms of control vocabularies, then obviously the limit of those values should be the limit of the range of numbers used by the site. And we tie the two together. And elsewhere in the OpenStreetMap wiki, well, we've recently started to document that if this tag has this value, here's how you construct a URL using that number. So a parser can look at the value in OpenStreetMap, go to the wiki and look at how to build a URL, put the two together and arrive at this web page. And from there they can download more data as JSON or XML or whatever. So we're starting to use OpenStreetMap very much as a link between different databases. So let's have a look at another example. Just across the road from the Repertory Theatre in Birmingham is a building called the Hall of Memory, built in 1925. Uh, which is an arts and crafts style war memorial. A uh, very beautiful building, very sombre, uh, and of course very, unfortunately, very necessary. And this is how it looks in OpenStreetMap in the JOSM editor. Far more tags than any of the things I've shown you so far. There's no limit on the number of those tags, uh, as long as you're putting sensible, useful data in. But I want to show you a few of those individually now. So, there they all are to start with. Let's have a look at a few. The English Heritage Reference Number. This is a listed building. In other words, it's a statutory protected monument in British law, or in English and Welsh law, I should say. Uh, and that's its reference number in the database. And again, that resolves to the URL on not one, but two different websites. One has the legal jargon of the listing that said why it's a listed building and what's significant about it. And the other one, run by the same people, English Heritage, which is a quasi-government body, has nice pictures but they both use the same identifier in the URLs. Uh, so it's an unusual example of one identifier being used in two different places. Uh, I don't know why I've got that slide there, I'll pass over that. Um, then the next one we have a URL. Now, the URL is the one official URL. It's not any URL about um, this, this particular object or, or uh, entity, but this is the local government page about that building which is this one. And then, most importantly, and I'll talk more about this later, uh, we have a Wikidata identifier. This object has an entry in Wikidata, and we have the Q reference number there uh, for the Wikidata object tagged in OpenStreetMap. Think how many buildings and other structures and geographical features are in OpenStreetMap that have entities in Wikidata and aren't yet tagged. This is a big challenge for us to, to cross-link these two very important databases. Incidentally, just as an aside, does anybody know why we use Q on that number? I know you know. <laughs> the guy that started Wikidata, his girlfriend's name started with Q or something? That's absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> It was a romantic gesture, and boy, I hope he got some brownie points for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think he really deserved it. That's the most romantic thing I've ever heard in geek. <laughs> so there's the Wikidata entry for the same structure. Uh, and at the time I did this, there were no matching results for Wikidata in, in the OpenStream Wiki, but that's out of date now. Now, we also tagged things with the Wikipedia uh, links. And some editors in OpenStreetMap find it easier to do that because they don't understand Q numbers, they don't know what they mean, and they like to see a piece of English that tells them what the entity is. And 
the, the structure of that tag is the language of the Wikipedia, so EN colon, and then the title as it appears in the wiki, in Wikipedia. So you take the page title, not the URL, you don't have the underscores, you don't escape uh, accented characters and so on, you just simply copy and paste the title. Now that's fine, it doesn't matter if you do that as well, but it is redundant to the Wikidata tag. And where you have something like uh, Buckingham Palace, which exists in maybe a hundred different language Wikipedias, that certainly would be redundant. So I normally recommend if you are going to do that, you do the one, two or three local languages to the place, rather than simply doing all of them. As long as you've got the Wikidata tag in. Of course, if we have humans putting in Wikipedia tags, we could then run a script that adds the corresponding Wikidata item. So that's uh, an, an option for the future. Sorry, and there is the Wikipedia item. Yes. Can, can, a, can a, a value have uh, multiple entries? Mm. Okay, so as many yes. As well. Sorry, you'd enter multiple entries separated by semicolon. Okay. So you have E N colon Hall of Memory Birmingham, semicolon F R equals and then the French title or whatever else it was. Now you can also tag related information, and there's a debate at the moment as to how much of this we should do. But the architect who designed that building was S. N. Cook, so we can tag Wikipedia colon architect and then put the name in. In fact, we've changed the way we do this since I took that slide. We now use architect colon Wikipedia in preference. And the reason we do that is it then sorts with the other tags next to the plain string tag for the architect. So uh, I, I really want to update that slide. And you can do the same with Wikidata. And again, we would now tag this architect colon Wikidata and the Q value. Now, you could tag material and use the Q value for Portland Stone if you wanted to. You could go to quite some extremes. If you need to do, well, when do you need to do that or not is a matter of debate. If you've got the tag that says this is the Wikidata entry, then all that other information, the material, the, the year of construction, the name of the architect, should be in Wikidata. And some people say we shouldn't duplicate that in OpenStreetMap, it's redundant, it bloats it, it's more to update if something changes. And other people say we should put as much as possible into OpenStreetMap and not rely on linking to a, an external source. Because if somebody queries OpenStreetMap, they should get everything returned in one go without having to then go and query something else. Again, it's a bit of a religious matter, uh, and you'll have your own views. And you're welcome to go to the OpenStreetMap wiki, find a discussion about tagging with Wikipedia and Wikidata, and contribute to that. Uh, we very much need more views and more input on that. It's possible to take a view of all the tags uh, in a map form that can be copied and pasted as data from the JOSM editor, uh, and you can get similar material returned to you as JSON or XML if you do a query against the API for, for OpenStreetMap. Somebody asked earlier whether putting the pillar box on the map created a specific URL. This is the example of the URL for the outline object of the Hall of Memory. So on the top, you see the identifier is the same identifier that you see in JOSM for the, the way, the, the, the outline of the building. You see down the left hand side all the tags and data that we have, and on the right hand side a render of the map with that object highlighted. So yes, there is a URL, and there is a web interface for humans that shows you all the data separate to the map ordinary map render, but there is also a URL that will, that will return you linked open data that is machine readable. And there it is. Uh, this uses a, a Russian tool called Rambler, which returns, and I can't remember, I think this is JSON, yes, this is JSON, uh, I could easily have got this as an XML. Same, same object, uh, and the Rambler tool has a human web interface where you can see the JSON so you can check what you're getting as part of the debugging of your application, but it also has a thing that will return it straight to your application when you run a query. And the Overpass API is another tool that does similar things. And again, I, I'm not the best person to explain the details of how that works. There'll be people in the session after the coffee break who will tell you all about these things and how they work and how you can code with them. But I'm uh, sufficiently knowledgeable to be aware that they exist 
and that they're very useful to people who write applications. This is another tool that does something similar. This is called Overpass Turbo, and again, it puts a human front end on. And the beauty of this is you can hack your query in the left-hand panel and see the results in the right-hand panel. And I know people who teach coding who use this as a teaching tool because you see the results of what you're doing almost as it happens. So this is a query for um, individual trees that are tagged in the city of Nottingham. Somebody has <coughs> gone around the local area and found a species of all the trees on the street and tagged them. I think they might have got a database from the local council with all that in. And there's one individual tree. Yes, yeah, see, the ref there, uh, the tag ref equals 0141, is the reference number in the database from which that was drawn. Uh, so uh, that's how you can tell that. And you can see there that it's a uh, cedar of Lebanon tree as the species that it has both the vernacular name and the scientific name Cedrus libani. So you can put all sorts of data into OpenStream if you want to. What you could have done with that as well is tag species colon wikidata equals and link to the wikidata entry about that species. So somebody can then use that to go and find the range of this species and which botan is named it and which year and which diseases it suffers from and goodness knows what else. The potential for linking things together in this way is absolutely immense. So there's a bit of a problem. I've talked so far about tagging things in OpenStreetMap with their Wikidata identifier. What if we wanted to put in, into Wikidata the link to OpenStreetMap for a particular object? So let's say this building. There is a Wikidata entry for this building and there is an outline of this building in OpenStreetMap. Well, we can't do that with any reliability because unfortunately the way OpenStreetMap is being built, the identifiers aren't necessarily stable. And I'll illustrate that. This is an area of a town called Bridge North outside Birmingham. And it's not as well mapped as the city of Birmingham is. So the roads are in there, as you can see, but nobody has yet mapped the buildings. So I decided to go and map one of them to, to illustrate this talk. And there it is. It's a single point. I should explain, by the way, I, I skipped over this earlier. Everything in, in OpenStreetMap is a point or a, a series of points. So you put a dot on OpenStreetMap and say, this is a pillar box, or this is a tree, or this is roughly the center of a building, which is what this one is. You can join some of those points together in a line, like down the right-hand side, and say, this is a road, or a river, or a railway line, and we call that a way. <coughs> and if you close the ends of a way, and make a polygon, which can be a circle or a square or a rectangle or far more complex, then that can be a way that represents a building or a geographical boundary like a county or a state or an area of land that's farmed as opposed to industrial use or whatever. So I've added this building and I've put in a little point and I've put the tags down here, the address, the house name, the postal code, the fact that it's a residential building, in other words, it's a house, uh, and I did it by a survey and estimate. So there it is. And there's all that data in a nice machine readable form. And one of the pieces of data in there is the number that's in this URL. This is the, the, the web representation of that data, uh, which is 2754 blah 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 627. So if you remember the last three digits of that, so that's 627. And you will try and remember that format. Uh, but it's just a dot. I know there's a house there, I drove past it this morning and I noticed the number, so I put a dot in. But when you look at the aerial view, uh, and we have some donated aerial imagery that we can trace from, of course it's a rectangular building, it's a nice big Victorian house, it might be a far more complex shape than that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw that rectangle on the map. And I'm going to copy all the tags from the point onto the rectangle, so it has the same name, the same address, it's still a residential building. Uh, the survey might now also say survey and, sorry, the uh, source might also say survey and aerial photography. Uh, turn off the aerial imagery and we now have a rectangle and we have a point in the middle of it and they, they're duplicating each other. So I delete the point and I'm left with the rectangle with all the original tags. And there's all the data. You can see the identifier at the top. But that is a different number. 
a different identifier to the original point. So if that was a famous notable building and there was a Wikidata entry about it and Wikipedia articles about it, and we put a pointer to the OpenStreetMap way, uh, sorry, to the OpenStreetMap entity, that point, it would no longer exist. And there is nothing to say that this rectangle represents the same building as the point that I deleted. I could have included something that says I'm replacing X with Y, but most editors don't and never have done that. So we have no continuity between the identifiers. Uh, let me just skip over that. <clears throat> to complicate matters, if you don't do a query on the web for the one that was deleted, you get a 200 return code in HTTP. In other words, the web server says, yes, I've got that. And it says, I have all this information about it. Oh, we, we deleted it, but yeah, it was there. It doesn't say 404, there's nothing there. And it doesn't say 301 or 300, I've redirected this over here. It's now at this other address. It just says, yes, I've got something about that. So you can't rely on those identifiers for inbound links. What you can do, uh, there is a workaround this one, unfortunately, is Wikidata has the coordinates as a value for this building, or for a notable building. So you can say, I'm looking at these coordinates, what have you got within 50 or 100 metres, or within, you know, if it's a, you're looking at a county, you'd probably say kilometres, that has the same Wikidata ID. So if the Wikidata tag, sorry, the Wikidata ID is in a tag in OpenStreetMap, you can look for it, and because it's unique, you know you're still looking at the same thing. So there is a workaround, it just takes a couple of queries and a bit of processing to do that. And that's relevant to this project proposal that I put together on OpenStreetMap a little while ago, and which we started working on at the Hackathon a couple of days ago. Again, I'm not a coder, so when I say we started working, I delegated it and went out of coffee. <laughs> And the idea is that we would run a bot or a series of bots uh, to put Wikidata tags into OpenStreetMap. Now there are a number of different ways you can do this. You can go through OpenStreetMap and look at things and say, right, we've got a building here, it's a, of a particular type, it's a railway station, does Wikidata have an equivalent with similar coordinates? Or you could go through categories on Wikipedia and say, Let's go through all the, the tube stations in London. Let's go through all the football stadiums in England. Let's go through all the bridges in France. And where we have the coordinates for that, it's in Wikidata, let's go to OpenStreetMap and let's do some fuzzy matching. You can't do an exact match. So we know we're looking for a football stadium in England. We have these coordinates. Wikidata has the coordinates for a point which is hopefully in the middle of the football stadium, but should be somewhere inside the perimeter of the football stadium. OpenStreetMap has a polygon describing the outside of that stadium. Right, that's the first stage. The second stage is, do we have entities with the same name? So do we have a villa park here and a villa park there? And thirdly, do we have similar types? Is this one tagged as a building and is this one a building? Or is this one tagged as a building and this is a football stadium? We're probably okay. If this one is tagged as a car park and this one is tagged as a building, we're probably not okay. We've got the wrong thing. So you can do this matching with varying degrees of fuzziness. And you can say, I'm fairly certain that this is the same, I'm absolutely categorically certain it's the same, or I think it might be the same but I'm not sure. And we have to agree where the limit is and providing we have an acceptable degree of certainty, the bot would then write a tag on OpenStreetMap saying this entity is represented by this Wikidata item. And I'll write the Q value in. And if I'm not certain, but I think there's a likelihood, I'll write it to a file somewhere, and then a human can go and check it, or maybe we'll have some, do any of you know the Wikidata game? Yeah, and I talked about the wheel map app on mobiles earlier. Somebody could write an app that says, are these two things the same, yes or no? Thank you. Are these two things the same, yes or no? Let's give you another one. And you can have humans processing things quite quickly from that list of potential matches. Uh, I'll put the URL for this proposal 
onto the ether pad at the end of this session. There is a discussion, uh, on either at the foot of it or at the talk page. I very much welcome your contributions, please, because at the moment there are some people who say, yes, we should do this, we should do it as soon as possible. There are some people who say, we should never automate this, we should always have a human check. And there are some people, and I don't know why they're involved in either projects, who say we should never link OpenStreetMap to Wikidata. They're two separate projects, let's not talk to each other. So, <laughs> they can go away and do things, but the, the other issues have to be addressed. Um, we have to decide how much certainty we need, when, how much we can automate, how much we can do by humans. And I, I don't have a strong view. I, I know that we have to accommodate both principles and we have to reach some sort of consensus about how to approach this. And I very much welcome comments from some of you, or indeed from all of you, if you're inclined, uh, on that discussion. We have somebody in the audience. Edward, are you hear it? Hi. Uh, who very kindly started on this process uh, during the hackathon. And this is an example of, or a couple of examples of the problems we might come up against. So, <coughs> Ed has produced a script which, which creates this list. Down the left hand side are Wikidata entries, and down the right hand side are OpenStreetMap entries. And most of them have a one to one relationship. So, we can confidently tag those and say that Warwick Castle Q, whatever it is, is Warwick Castle 1 1, whatever it is, in OpenStreetMap. They're the same thing because there's nothing else they could be. There's nothing else in the vicinity called Warwick Castle. But for some of these, for the National Railway Museum, for HMS Belfast and so on, OpenStreetMap has two entities matching one in Wikidata, and we don't know why. So let's have a look at those examples. Canary Wharf is a railway station on the London Underground and Docklands Light Railway, if I'm not mistaken. So there it is in OpenStreetMap, and there it is again in OpenStreetMap somewhere else. And if we look at them together, um, thank you, uh, one is bottom right, it's not highlighted in this, um, then we can see they're part of the same complex, but because they're in different levels and intersecting, they're, they're mapped twice. So, which of those two should we tag with the Wikidata entry? Hmm. Or can we make something in OpenStream, I call a relation and include them both and say, this group of things relates to this Wikidata entry? And we don't yet have an answer for that. So our hypothetical bot that's going to go through to this tagging at the moment would have to say, well, I'm not going to do that one. I don't know. So we'll have to put that in, in English. We say we, we knock it into the long grass. We, we kick it off the football field into the long grass and forget about it conveniently for the future. But even so, there are so many where we get a direct match that we shouldn't let these things stop us altogether. The National Railway Museum in York, if you've got some spare time after this conference, a marvellous place to visit, full of old steam diesel and electric engines and railway wagons and so on, tells the story beautifully. Uh, so there it is, that's their workshop, um, <coughs> I think, and that's their other building, either side of Lehman Road. So how would we tag that? Again, do we have a relation between the two? Do we tag one of them as being the Wikidata one because it's the main one and the other one is the annex? It'll probably take a human to determine that. Maybe OpenStreetMap has mapped them wrongly. Maybe in OpenStreetMap, one of those should be called the National Railway Museum, and the other one should be called the National Railway Museum Workshop, or the National Railway Museum Annex. So, you know, maybe there's a need for a human to intervene in OpenStreetMap and improve the quality of the data in there. I don't know, I, I wouldn't like to call that one. Here's another example. This is a ship on the River Thames just down here called HMS Belfast, quite a historic warship. You can pay to go on board and visit it as a tourist attraction. It's obviously retired now. That's <coughs> unequivocally a ship. It's, it's ship shaped. It's sitting in the water. And if you go down there, it's a big metal thing with funnels on. <coughs> but OpenStreetMap also says that is HMS Belfast. That is not <coughs> HMS Belfast. That is not a ship. That is not in the water. That is not made of metal. It does not have funnels. <laughs> that is a kiosk where they will sell you a ticket to go on HMS Belfast. <laughs> So we wouldn't tag that as being the Wikidata entry that says it's a ship and it fought in these battles and it was made in this shipyard. <laughs> what we can do is say somebody should go into OpenStreetMap and change that to say HMS Belfast ticket fields. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody hasn't done that while I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so again, you're going to need human intervention, but in terms of tagging with Wikidata, we, we've said, right, we've got two things that are tagged HMS Belfast but only one of them has a tag that says this is a ship. So we know we can tag that one with the Wikidata item. We don't need to tag the one that's tagged ticket kiosk or building. So we're going to have to write some rules for this tagging. 
what we do need a human to go and fix the tag, the labeling in OpenStreetMap. In terms of the Wikidata tagging, we could write some code that does that. But then we have to say, right, we're looking at ships and buildings and railway stations and football stadiums and hills and rivers and canals and lakes and ponds. We're not going to do all this in one bot job in one go. It's going to take a series of, of, of processes and stages. And we need to do the low hanging fruit. We need to do the easy things first. We need to do the things that there are a lot of because we get good numbers of results uh, first and work on the other stuff later. Uh, that's just showing the two things in collaboration. And, and that shows, sorry, that shows that the, the big metal thing has historic ship as a tag in OpenStreetMap. So we know that's the thing that should have the Wikidata tag because the Wikidata entry also says this is a ship. And the other thing, as you can see here, is tagged as a building, as I said. So that's uh, the end of the presentation. I hope you've enjoyed that. Those are my contact details if you'd like to discuss this. I will go over coffee and, and update the etherpad with some of the links I've talked about. Do we have some time for questions? Yeah, we've got six minutes left. Okay, question here. Yeah, at Brian UK, anyone? Postcodes, two questions. Is a postcode where something is? And what is the popularized implication? So, for example, you go to a hotel, and you follow your GPS, you often end up with goods loading bay, yes. rather than reception. Or even a different part of town, and that's where they're letters and delivery to. Secondly, does the Royal Mail own, own that copyright? So where have we got it from? What are the implications? Okay, I can speak to this a little bit. First of all, this is a very UK specific question. And, and Ireland as well, sorry. Well, so yes, UK and Ireland. Uh, different things apply in other countries. The postcode database is a copyright database that belongs to Royal Mail. They see it as a highly valuable property, they won't release it. They won't give it to us to use, they won't, they won't release it under an open license. We've tried, we've tried very hard, a number of people at different levels, including former government ministers of course, and call on The postcode itself represents a postman or postwoman's walk. It's where the mail is delivered to. That's why it was created, and people have misapplied it for GPS and other things because it's a convenient label and people know what they are and companies and hotels and businesses put them on their websites and their letterheads so they're easy to find. So if they do have utility. Although the database is copyrighted and we can't therefore import it into OpenStreetMap, it is perfectly legal to add postcodes to buildings and other entities in OpenStreetMap if you already know them. So if you get a, a letter from a business with their postcode on, you can then go to the website to OpenStreetMap and add that postcode to the building if you're sure you know which building it is. And we are slowly building an independent database with the same data in, and that's perfectly legal in this country. If you want to know more about it, I suggest we discuss it over copper because it is, as I say, a very UK specific thing. Any more questions? Hi. Um, the question is, is there a relationship or a collaboration between Ordnance Survey, which again is the UK mapping body, and, and OpenStreetMap? Um, it depends who you ask. There are people in, open, in Ordnance Survey who spend their weekends mapping for OpenStreetMap. So they're very individually very keen on it. And we have a cordial relationship. I mean, I, I presented the OpenStreetMap State of the Map Conference, their version of Wikimania in Birmingham last year. And we had a speaker from Ordnance Survey, and he survived intact, which was really good. Uh, there was hardly anything thrown at him. Um, so we get on with them. But their data is mostly copyright. There are certain bits of it that are under an open license that you can reuse. Uh, and I don't understand the detail, but there are, there are circumstances where some of it, most of it is copyright and you can't import it. Whether they're looking at what OpenStreetMap does and putting it back into Ordnance Survey, I wouldn't like to say. I doubt whether they would be taking the data back. What they might be doing is looking for things like when we add a newly built road, they might say, oh, crap, we're going to go out and survey that. Uh, and that's a, an, an issue for us at OpenStreetMap as well, is finding out when these things are happening. Any more questions? Hi. Yeah, I mean, with the uh, Ordnance Survey or the other national mapping authorities, how does the support of the data compare now? Um, well, the first thing is it's usually different. So if you overlay the maps exactly, you'll find things are slightly out because we use different reference points. Um, but that's not an issue unless you're um, laying a gas pipe or something crucial. Uh, it's good enough to get you to somewhere or to you know your GPS or whatever. Um, 
Ordnance Survey have extremely high quality data. It's not necessarily very timely data. So when uh, a bypass opened in Birmingham a couple of years ago, one of the map local mappers was at the opening ceremony on the phone, and as the ribbon was cut and the first car went down, he was phoning somebody back at base who made the edit that changed it from under construction to in years. <laughs> Certainly the Ordnance Survey website wasn't updated for a number of weeks, and Google Maps for a number of months, so, so we can be more timely. Um, we're not as complete in OpenStreetMap. As I said earlier, there are areas of Britain, and indeed of the world, where the mapping is very important, <coughs> where it's just roads, uh, and where we, we need more people out there with GPSs surveying uh, and actually getting the infrastructure in. Any more questions? We have a question that's not about the UK. Yeah, well, it's a general question, which is, can you use an iPad or an iPad, uh, smartphone to do uh, geo, I mean, to take photographs of things and upload it directly? Yes. Um, you, you can use the GPS type apps and, and register where you are. Yeah. Um, certainly, um, we recommend you do more than one pass uh, if yeah. you can. So if you're going to do a footpath, you walk it three or four times and then average the GPS results because an individual result will want the slight distance, I'm sure you're aware. And you can do that on mobile devices. and, and app, would, you, would you use one of the apps that you prefer? Yeah, the Vespucci, Vespucci, as I say, is a very good Android app for, for that sort of thing. Um, and if you can't use GPS, if you can't use your smartphone or device for mapping in terms of drawing the lines on the ground, you can still use it for tagging things with URLs and the name of the operator or the, the type of business in a shop or whatever. One more question, I think we're out of time. Hi? Is it only points on maps that OpenStreetMap um, tracks where the data came from? Or when somebody's added tags, you also have to say, how do you know? In theory, you should say it for everything. In practice, um, people don't, and, and I think usually they don't, depending on how um, likely it is that somebody's going to query where it came from. Uh, is, is that a field for every tag? You can do, yes, you can, you can do things like architect source equals this book, um, material equals visual estimate or whatever, but people don't tend to because it's usually not contentious. On this, uh, what's also often done is when you edit something, it's a set of edits which is put in at once, and like in Wikipedia, you can. Yes, we have a, a sort of edit summary. Or for an, a, a com an edit summary. Edit. Yes, and that specifically prompts you to say where you got your information from. And some people are better at using it than others, frankly. But, uh, but we try. Okay, I think we're done. Thank you all for your time. one change, even if you're just putting the name of your local shop on. Uh, and thank you again.